I'll read out the questions and then uh, say something about them. In a recent survey by the Wall Street Journal, the number one thing Americans, men and women, would do in a world without health consequences is eat all the sweet, salty, high-fat food they want. How do we teach these, reach these people about using food only to maintain their bodies and not for pleasure and indulgence? Well, according to this, they're not doing it because they are aware of health consequences. It says that in a world without them, they would do it. So obviously they're not doing it because they're aware. And that's exactly what the Buddha said. Fear and shame are the guardians of the world. Hiri Utapa. They're afraid of their health consequences, so they're not doing it. So all one needs to do is make sure that people know the consequences of their deeds. And apparently this is fine. Working out all right. <laughs> You were talking about distraction being opposite for mindfulness and the me being at the root of each distraction. Would you go into this a little further? Well, if we label the distractions properly, we would know that either what we want or what we don't want comes up what we're hoping for in the future, or haven't forgotten about the past. So, who is wanting and who is not wanting? So, in that case, if what happens to me is more important than the meditation, that's the distraction. The thought that me wants to meditate, and me wants to be happy because of meditation is a distraction. It takes understanding of the thoughts that come up. So all we have to do is label them and we can see they're all concerned with me. What else? Who else? Anybody that we think about has some connection to me. So all the distractions come that way. The best thing to do is to try what I said to do. Put the meditation first and yourself second or third or fourth. And you'll know. You'll experience it. Can you give more examples of substituting wholesome for unwholesome thoughts in daily life? For example, angry thoughts when other drivers cut one off, or judging thoughts. Well, what we usually use as an example is when someone else gets the last space in the parking lot. have sympathetic joy. <laughs> Be happy for that person. They got a parking spot. What else can one do? If one gets upset or irate, one can and must remember that one is just making bad karma <coughs> for oneself. And not only is one making the bad karma, one is experiencing the result of that bad karma immediately. Namely, one gets irritated, angry, upset. It's a result. The result of the thought, I want that parking spot, and I was here first, and this person is doing the wrong thing, that is the making of the bad karma, and the result is the irritation. 
So we don't have to wait for our karma to fruit for next life. It does it immediately, one second after we've thought it. And this is another thought that people often have or misunderstanding that karma is connected with a former life or a future life. Sure it is, but what we experience is now. So that's the only thing that's really interesting, what we're experiencing now. So tomorrow, when people come and can't find a parking spot, I hope they can practice what is called in Pali, mudita, joy with others. Can I get trapped, attached to absorption states? Sure, we get attached to anything. But one can consider the fact, what is it better to get attached to? Cigarettes, chocolate, ice cream, one's own body, other people's body, absorption states, choices. (laughs) Make choices. I was taught in the Thai tradition, Achan Somedo and others, that once concentration on the breath is established, one should open awareness at all sense doors and observe the arising and passing of all conditioned phenomena. This seems to differ from the instruction to follow the breath throughout meditation. Could you please comment on these two methods as I'm confused on what to do? First thing I'd like to say is, I have already um, mentioned that I think you'd be best off doing exactly what I'm saying for this week. And then starting next Saturday noon, you do whatever. If you like to continue, that's fine. If you don't, do something else. But you've got to give it a try. And then you won't be confused either because you're doing exactly what the the instructions are. But in order to explain the difference, it's not difficult to explain the difference. You see, the... um, Concentration on the breath only becomes complete when we can let go of that method and become absorbed. Absorption, the jhanas, is the next step after having completely concentrated on the breath long enough for it to happen. So if we do that throughout a whole meditation session, no doubt, absorption will take place. It's a natural outcome. There is no other way except when one veers away from it on purpose and does something else, as what is mentioned here. What is mentioned here is going from the uh, method to insight and not from the method of meditation to tranquility and from tranquility to insight. So it's missing the middle step. Unfortunately, it's missing it practically everywhere. The Buddha taught the meditative absorptions. He did them himself and taught them in all the discourses, particularly in the Majjhima Nikaya and the Middle End sayings, where he describes the pathway from ordinary consciousness to enlightenment. Absorptions are not enlightenment. They are the bridge. They are that which leads us to a different consciousness. So in practically all uh, teachings these days, and for a long time already, uh, that particular step is not used. I don't know why I can't answer that. I don't know why it's not used. I think I have heard it said to go directly to inside is a shortcut. The Buddha didn't take that shortcut. 
Maybe it is a shortcut, I don't know. During your Sunday talk in San Diego, you stated fear is like hate or something like that. Could you please elaborate this? Well, we can only fear what we don't like. We couldn't possibly fear what we love. And there are those two as the main categories as of our hindrances. That's greed and hate, wanting and not wanting. So under the category of hate comes also fear. Because obviously we wouldn't be fearful if we were loving whatever it is that we are afraid of. So when we can examine our own fear and can try to ascertain what it is that we don't want to happen, what we reject, and then we'll see that this is dislike. It doesn't have to be passionate hate. Hate is a sort of a heading, a heading for everything that we don't want. <laughs> Next one is cute. Given anatta, what is it that is aware of awareness? It is there's awareness and then being aware of awareness. I'm afraid that's one of, the, one of those convolutions of the mind that go, get us nowhere. These are mental formations. And awareness is a mental formation. And an observer is a mental formation. And the observer, to know the observer, as long as we know the observer, we don't know the awareness. And if we know the awareness, we don't know the observer. We can't do two things at the same time. So try it out. Whoever was asking this try to do both at the same time. It can't be done. Which is actually very lucky for us that we can't do two things at the same time with our mind. Only one at a time. The other thing that we do and which is usually the uh, greatest stumbling block for having any sense of non-self is that we identify strongly with the observer. If we have given up the identification with the body, or at least have minimized it a bit, and have also minimized our other identifications to some extent, the observer is the strongest identification that is left. And not only is it left, but it overrides the understanding, what it means, no self. An observer is also a mental formation. I became stuck during your loving-kindness meditation over the concept of the beloved person. I am single without a partner or family, and I wondered if you could expand the concept for those in my situation. Well, it's not a concept. It's a feeling. And if there is no such feeling in one's heart, it's, um, it's a lack which makes life without juice, so it doesn't have to be a partner. It doesn't have to be family, children. There are other people in the world. There are other things in the world. Love can be developed for many other ideals. I mentioned, for instance, loving the Buddha loving the Dhamma, loving nature, finding that spark of love in one's heart. Since it is always difficult to find that spark of love without having some concrete 
instruction or some concrete um, focus. I use something. In this case, I was using the most beloved person. But we'll do loving kindness meditation every evening here, and it will be of a different uh, sort every evening. And so the one that one finds is the most useful, that's the one one should continue with. However, and I think that's also important to mention at this time, when we do the loving kindness meditation and you don't feel a thing, don't worry. Keep thinking it. Thinking is also a sense contact. And all sense contacts have feeling. And eventually, if we have thought it often enough, the feeling arises. We are able to change our mind and our heart. Love is learnable. It's not a matter of luck. And it does not depend on a person being near one. So if this particular loving-kindness meditation was not useful, there will be many others. And if none of them are useful, dream one up yourself. I've been dreaming them up for years. So start now. Dream them up. They're just your own creation, your own inventiveness. Meditation, although it follows a certain pattern and path, to get at it is very often an individual way of doing it. And it's very helpful to be a creative and inventive. But in this case, what is being said here, it is very important to think of whatever there is in one's own life and see whether there isn't someone that triggers a loving feeling. It's left to be the uh, grand passion. Love is not passion anyway. But there must be someone somewhere that triggers something or something and if it isn't, think it, and it will come. My beloved person died. I have no beloved now. Is it okay if I focus on my now deceased beloved? Yes, certainly. It's um, perfectly all right to focus on whatever triggers the feeling. That's all this was for. This was in order to trigger the feeling and then use the feeling for the purpose of going further afield. Regarding replacing unwholesome thoughts, do you mean you think the opposite even if you don't believe it? Perhaps some examples would aid comprehension. No, you, <laughs> you've got to believe it. <laughs> you've got to believe in the first place that you're only hurting yourself with unwholesome thinking. And you don't even have to believe that. Why don't you try it out? Why don't you just try it and see what happens? You get upset about something or someone. How do you feel? You feel good? How do you feel irritated, unpleasant? So it's so easy to see that we have immediate karmic resultants, cause and effect, whatever you like to call it, when there's negativity. So that you don't need to believe. You just need to do it and experience it. And for instance, when you think of not believing, like 
you get angry or, <coughs> or upset at a person because they're not supporting your ego. They're not appreciative. They're not helpful. They're not thinking of you. They're thinking of themselves. They're not doing what you think is right. And instead of being angry, supposedly you're supposed to love that person. But you can't get away from the dislike of the person's actions or words. And you are trying, but you can't get away from it. Investigate. Why? Why don't I like what's going on? Why do I have this rejection? And every answer you get is a new question until you come to the bottom line, if you make it that far. The bottom line is always ego. But you've got to get there yourself. It's no use next time you get angry at somebody thinking, oh yeah, that's right, it's only ego, and continuing to be angry. <laughs> that's also often done. It's useless. You've got to make that inquiry, that question and answer, and when you get that down to the bottom line, then you have your own personal experience. You know. That's not going to prevent having that same unpleasant experience again. But it will prevent that you believe that this is the way to do it, to have that anger and dislike. The, uh, that is shaken. And the more it's shaken, the less often it arises. So it's not a matter of belief. The Buddha didn't have anything to do with a belief system. All he wanted people is to try it out. Practice. Practice what he suggested and see for themselves. There's absolutely nothing to believe. It's all personal experience. Um, another thing in this respect is that if somebody does something that you don't like and you are convinced it's bad and it's wrong and therefore you're also convinced that your rejection is justified remember that your rejection is in your heart the bad and wrong is in the other person's heart so why buy into that? Why make it what we call double dukkha? What for? <laughs> Compassion with the other person, realizing that oneself has done wrong things and has suffered from them, so we can have empathy feeling with, and everything's fine. We're not going to change that other person right then and there. If it's a person that's near to us, our example might have some uh, effect, but um, we don't have to get involved. You say to substitute a positive thought for a negative one, I think for some thoughts that is possible, but for other thoughts there are powerful feelings attached and these keep forcing themselves into your awareness even though unwelcome. Certainly. If that wasn't the case, it would be so simple, everybody would be doing it. So um, this difficulty is quite true that exists this difficulty but what we can do first of all what I've already said is that inquiry question and answer 
into yourself why it is like that. But also, we can take a step which is sort of like a, a bridge and not an immediate substitution with the opposite. The Buddha called it substitution with the opposite, but it's not always possible. It's quite true because it's too strong, the feeling. So if we have a negative feeling, one that is angry or judgmental or disliking, and we can't immediately change that and substitute something which is loving and compassionate, then the thing to do is to take the mind away from those negativities and put it onto something which is beautiful and calming, like a flower garden, a rose bush, waves in the ocean, maybe a beautiful sunset, sunrise, anything that is not connected with this negativity. And when the mind has calmed down enough then we can try again to substitute with the opposite. The Buddha just called it substituting with the opposite. He didn't realize that we would have great difficulty with that because it is an old established method and tradition which has always been used. But since we haven't grown up in that method and tradition, we might need and often do need this intermediate step. Anything is better than sticking to the hateful thought. And again, hate is here only a category, negative thought. Anything is better. How do I prevent torpor from happening during the afternoon meditation at the heat of the day. <laughs> well, there's some um, possibilities. One is um, meditating with the eyes open, looking down on the floor, having them just a little bit open, not focusing on the floor, but just keeping them open. It's... Um, it's a support for not falling asleep. But even more um, effective is instead of trying to become calm through attention on the breath would be to do contemplation. And today we have done the first one. We'll be doing one every day. And here we did today, we did contemplation on our own mindfulness, on our own um, understood experience. You can use that. But if the torpor is very great, contemplate your own death. It wakes most people up. <laughs> and we will talk about that more because it is a very important contemplation. But it's just a suggestion for this uh, problem. Oh, and giving yourself a pep talk. Pain is often a signal from the body that something is not right or blocked. And we often ignore those messages to our physical detriment. How should we know when pain should be not responded to and when it should? It's not a matter of not responding. It's a matter of not disliking. That's the essence of it. When we dislike it, it means that we only like one aspect of ourselves. Namely that one aspect when our body for a little while isn't doing anything other than what we would like it to do. But pain physical pain, that's what it's about, isn't it? Yes, physical pain, is 
a great teacher because it shows us in the first place how much we identify with the body how we react to physical pain and particularly in the way of trying to get away from it and also that that reaction does not promise any great results because the body can be seen at that time as something which is never quite satisfactory and that does not depend on age it gets more so mostly with age but it doesn't have to depend on that and learning that the body is not quite satisfactory reduces our identification and attachment to it doesn't take it away but it reduces it and we may be able to look at it more objectively as a physical manifestation and as we see it as a physical manifestation eventually we don't see it anymore as me and the real understanding can arise so all dukkha which pain is also is a great teacher and if we use it as a teacher then we're using it in the right way if we use it for dislike we're in the same pathway and in the same trap as the rest of the world Ah, this is a very practical and good question here. How many audio cassettes, tapes, will there be? <laughs> More than one? Yeah, definitely. Will all the loving-kindness um, guided meditations be on one tape? Will the Dhamma talks be on the same? How many tapes will there be total if one wanted the entire set? if one wanted just the Dhamma talks and questions and answers? A very good question, I can't quite answer it. Um, there are nine Dhamma talks altogether, and the question and answers will also be on a separate tape. And I'm not sure how many. Three, maybe? And Loving Kindness will be on a separate tape, and um, there will probably be well, I don't know, also three loving-kindness tapes, and the contemplations will be on separate tapes. So the Dhamma talks are by themselves, and then question-answers are by themselves, loving-kindness by themselves, and contemplation by themselves. So you have several contemplations, you'll have several loving-kindness, and uh, you'll have several evenings of question and answers. So if you just want the Dhamma talks, which it says here, and the question and answers, it might be something like 13 tapes, but um, please don't hold me to that. <coughs> it's, a, it's approximate. You speak of not consulting friends for advice should we have a problem, that we are the only ones with an answer in us. Where does the role of comforting well-meaning friends come into play. I think that's a misunderstanding of something I said. The Buddha said that a noble friend is the whole of the spiritual path. A noble friend is one who also practices and is one who ideally would be a little further ahead so that we can get some guidance from such a friend. In Pali a noble friend is called Karyana Mitta and uh, it's very often the meditation teacher is meant by that. But it doesn't have to be because we can have noble friends that are practicing and support our practice and urge us to practice. They are such people that we can rely upon, that we know will 
be helpful and loving. And there are people who will tell us the truth. And there are people who will keep our secrets. And there are people who will be sure to speak in a good and loving way about us and will try to make others see that. We can't hope or rely that somebody else will solve our problems. The one thing that will solve our, solve our problems is practice. The meditation and the practice of purification. That solves all problems. But noble friends or one noble friend is essential. Somebody that we can actually rely on. Not necessarily that such a person has to be comforting. Comforting may be quite the wrong thing. They might be, and they should be, inspiring. But comforting at times is necessary. But at other times, it's much more important to inspire someone to actually get on with the practice and find the way out of Dukkha. Only someone who has already found an opening out of Dukkha will be able to do that. The other thing which um, is also connected here is that if we have a personal attachment to a certain person, it's not helpful. Because again, that attachment will prevent us from having unconditional, impersonal love. The attachment breeds fear. And fear is hate. We don't hate the person. We hate the idea of loss. And so we don't have the purity of emotion. So that's only one of the dangers which arises which can, in the beginning, not be avoided, but we can be aware of it. In the enlightened state, do desires no longer arise, or do they arise, but we just don't follow them? I think the Buddha would have said, why don't you become enlightened and find out for yourself? <laughs> but... Uh, in the beginning, where there are four steps or stages of enlightenment, and the earlier ones, the desire changes into preference. And preference does not necessarily have to be satisfied. And later, if there is preference, there is no need to satisfy. And desires, passionate desires, that's all muted because Nibbana means non-burning, no passions. There's no burning desires. What are some methods you could suggest for calming and focusing the mind to watch the breath? Well, exactly what we're doing. Huh? Um, the first thing that I have mentioned last night were five support systems of which one should choose one. Counting, word, picture, sensation, beginning, middle, end. There's a very important support system, one of those. One can try another one, but not during one meditation session. Always using one of these support systems during a whole meditation session, not using all five um, and then starting all over again with, with the five. That doesn't work at all. One should start every meditation session 
with loving kindness for oneself. And if the one we have done is not useful, we're going to do many others. And as I said already, be inventive. When we have a feeling of warmth and love for ourselves, the mind naturally becomes quiet. It's its natural result. It doesn't look around for any other support, any other uh, appreciation, which it does in thinking, gets to thinking. That's a support for the ego. If one has already that feeling of being embraced in one's own love, one doesn't have to look for so many other things. So that's a big help. And another help would be to recognize that the distracted and distraught mind is self-imposed dukkha. We're doing it all ourselves. Why continue? It's totally unnecessary. We are the makers of our own happiness and our own unhappiness. Why don't we choose the happiness? We'd all like it. So if we choose it, choose it determinately. Not just hoping, but with willpower which is one of the other seven factors of enlightenment. And if we make a choice like that, and we make that choice over and over again, eventually the mind will listen to that. The mental factor of making the right choice will bring about the mental factor of being able to stick to that right choice. Um, Could you please speak a little more about purification of emotions, how to prevent strong emotions and passions to arise, and what to do with them once they have arisen? Um, That's a topic for tomorrow, so we'll leave that to tomorrow. What can you suggest for dealing with everyday fears and anxieties? All our fears, all our anxieties are fear of death. There is no other fear. We give it different names. Some people say they're afraid of the dark. Others are afraid of snakes. Some are afraid of women. Some are afraid of men. Some are afraid of old age, of poverty of pain, of sickness, of losing their loved ones, of not being appreciated, of not being supported. All names, it's all the same thing. It's a fear of the death, in one case the death of the ego, which would be a great boon, but we're still afraid of that. It's the ego being afraid of that. And the other is the a a fear of the physical death because we think we are now we are and then we're not. The uh, strongest craving that we have is the craving to be here, to be. So with that craving, of course we're afraid that's not going to be fulfilled. So every fear, whether it's an everyday one or just a Sunday one, doesn't matter. They're all the same thing. They're afraid of not being. Not being somebody, not being um, that what one wants to be, others not realizing what one is, and so forth. The uh, antidote for all that is again, inquiry. Ask. Why am I afraid? First of all, what am I afraid of? Then, why am I afraid? And then, the answer, 
is a new question. And another antidote is something that we're going to do. And the me being at the root of each distraction, which you go into this a little further, that because the concentration is better for some people, that full concentration ensues. So I will mention that right now too, because it will take a little time yet till we get to the meditative absorptions. I'm going along the seven factors of enlightenment in their traditional um, sequence. And at this moment, we're still at the first one, mindfulness. But because the Buddha gave us methods, it's important to have those methods at hand. It's quite possible that if the concentration comes about doing this, what is called sweeping, and please don't visualize a little broom and uh, going through the body with that because that's also detrimental to concentration. It's quite possible that the concentration becomes so that there is an overall delightful sensation the same one through the whole body. If that's the case, stop the sweeping and go to that overall sensation, but only if it's totally delightful. And that is the entrance to the first jhana, to the first meditative absorption. So when you feel that, do stop. All these things that we're doing and that are being taught are methods. And real meditation starts when the method stops. So the overall sensation which fills you from head to toe at that time would be utterly delightful and most likely it can be a tingling. It can be other sensation. There are 17 different sensations mentioned as possibilities for the first jhana. I dare say there are more than 17, but the most common ones are this very, very pleasant tingling, (coughs) a feeling of all-embracing warmth, not heat, Heat is due to over-anxiousness and result thinking. No heat, just overall warmth, usually emanating from the spiritual heart, from here. A feeling of physical expansion that we're losing the limitations of the body. At the moment we know exactly where we begin and end height and breadth and everything, but that limitation is lost. A lightness as opposed to heaviness, and sometimes a feeling of floating, and sometimes a feeling of upward expansion. Any one of these, there can be others. The criteria is it's utterly delightful. And then you stop whatever you're doing and go to that sensation. So that's another possibility which arises because of concentration. Obviously, that can arise in any meditation. It doesn't have any of the methods as a monopoly. It's strictly due to concentration. If you have no feeling in a larger part of the body, if it's a small spot, it doesn't matter. It will come next time you go there. But if it's a large part of the body, like for instance, the whole left side of the trunk, then instead of just going slowly down, spot after spot, take 
like a strip of let's say one and a half inches I mean you don't have to measure it I'm only sort of guessing and you start at the shoulder and you go down that strip to the waist up again down again up again four times down up down up not quite that quick and then go to the next strip and the next strip all the way across let's say from the left shoulder to the right do all this with a strip the same goes for if that happens on the back in other words when there are large areas where you can't feel anything do it with that strip method it can be very helpful if you can't feel anything the uh, reason for that is mostly we are not inside of yourself you're outside trying to figure out where you ought to be what's my left arm doing or that type of thing try to get inside of yourself and I'd like to repeat once more if you don't like doing it it's absolutely essential that you do it if you have and this is a particularly uh, helpful learning situation if you have an unpleasant emotion you notice it you let go and go to the next spot this is the most worthwhile teaching and learning for non-reaction it's something that we never do in daily life and one more thing which I mentioned and which I'd like to explain a little bit I mentioned hard and soft and moist and dry and moving and still and warm and cool these characteristics depict the four elements the four primary elements which are called earth fire water and air or wind of which all living bodies consist not just people and as soon as there is the opportunity we will do a contemplation on that but meanwhile since we don't have the time right now just remember that the hardness is the earth element the warmth or the coolness is the fire element the um, moistness or the moisture or the dryness obviously the water element and the uh, movement or the stillness is the wind element so these are quite apparent in this particular method they have come apparent in all methods but here they are a little uh, easier to see so when you feel that remember the primary elements from which everything is fashioned that exists it helps us again to be more objective towards ourselves as we can see the whole universe in this fathom long body we realize our togetherness we realize this non-separation and we also can see a glimpse maybe of this illusion which makes us act with the me in front this illusion which makes us act as as if <coughs> we are the main actor in this whole theater and as of all the rest of the world are just having supporting roles it's really funny and one day one can smile about it there are six billion main actors 
and they all have six billion minus one supporting actors helping them. I mean, obviously it can't be true, but we still do it. And even when we realize it can't be true, we do it. But when we use a proper method and actually are attentive enough, it does arise as an experience. And that the, the four primary elements do help us. I dare say there will be a few questions left which you can all put in the uh, bowl for this evening. And right now, we'll say our little verse for lunch. Please say after me. Reflecting carefully, I use this food. Not for pleasure. Not for indulgence. But only for maintaining this body. So that it endures. For keeping it unharmed. For supporting life. So that former feelings of hunger are destroyed. And new feelings from overeating do not arise. Then there will be for me a lack of bodily obstacles. And living comfortably.